Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 7th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you can also follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain how Republican legislative candidates have hamstrung themselves this election cycle. Second, we discuss how those candidates who continue to press for Cook Inlet gas subsidies are proposing to set the state backward economically. And third, we discuss the message being sent by some shifts in ownership of North Slope oil assets. And now, let's join Michael. All right, Brad. Well, let's uh, let's uh, let's dive into it. The weekly top three. We'll start off with number one, uh, and uh, y- y- your supposition is that the Republicans have backed themselves into a bit of a corner this election cycle, and um, and so give us give us your thoughts on that. What do you what do you mean by that? Well, there was an op-ed in the ADN uh, written by former Anchorage School District Superintendent uh, Carol Como that. Uh, uh, Brings this brings this to mind. the The title of the op ed was uh, "Featherly." She's talking about Walter Featherly, who's a uh, a candidate, uh, uh, a de- uh, independent candidate, Democrat candidate uh, in uh, in South Anchorage uh, for the legislature. Featherly is a fighter for kids and schools. Well, as we've talked about on the show a lot. Uh, uh, people who propose PF, PFD cuts propose to fund uh, government through PFD cuts, which Featherly is doing, uh, aren't fighting for kids. They're fighting to take dollars out of the hands of kids and 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 and, and shield uh, top twenty percent non residents and the oil companies uh, from paying for government costs. They are they are doing the exact opposite of what they claim they're doing. Uh, They're taking money from kids, from middle and lower income Alaska family kids in particular, uh, and and, and spending that on things that they wanna do instead of using a broad base and getting contributions towards those those goals, towards those spending goals from uh, from the top 20% uh, non-resident and uh, and, uh, and the oil companies. But, and here's and and Republicans should be calling them out. But here's the deal. Here's what here's how Republicans have backed themselves into a corner. Republicans sort of are are Democrat light in the sense that they say they want to spend also. Julie Cologne, who Featherly is running against, isn't saying, oh no, I don't want to spend. What she's saying is, I just want to spend differently or I want to spend a little bit less. Than, than the independent does. But because they don't propose alternative revenue measures, what's going on is, is they can't call the Democrats out for being hip- hypocrites when they say they're doing it for the kids, when in fact they're not doing it for the kids. If the Republicans would talk about alternative revenue measures, more broad-based, like Ben Carpenter, more broad-based revenue measures that drew a little bit from everybody. When they talked about when they talked about their campaign, when they talked about their opponent, 
they could call the opponent out and said, look, he's a hypocrite. Walter Featherly is a hypocrite because he says he's doing it for the kids, but he's not. He's doing it for, he's doing it to shield. He's doing, he wants to spend more, but he's doing it in a way that shields the top 20% non-resident in the old companies. Featherly has, has in particular said that he supports SB 21 as it is that he doesn't think we need to raise, that he doesn't think the old companies need to, need to contribute more. He thinks we ought to take it out of PFD cuts. And in fact, in the Alaska Beacon, uh, 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 questions and answers, Featherly said we ought to take it out of the PFD, that he thinks the PFD should be cut to pay for these things. But, but Cologne can't call him out for that, can't call him out for the hypocrisy of that, just like a bunch of the other Republicans can't call their Democrat opponents out for the hypocrisy of wanting to spend, but spending it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families and on the backs of kids can't call them out because they don't have an alternative revenue measure. Ben, really, Carpenter, really is the only one, only Republican in the state that's able to do that because he's got a fiscal plan that that spreads the base broadly, gets a contribution of a little bit from everybody. And he's got the ability to call out Bork Dorkman for being the hypocrite he is, for saying that we ought to spend, but we ought to do it on the backs of the very people that Bjorkman claims to be defending. Right. Well, and in Ben's, fair- about, Ben's about the only one able to do that, though. Well, and in fairness, Ben is not just talking about a single issue either. He's also talking about the other uh, components of the fiscal policy working group, which includes an increase to oil taxes and some cuts and some uh, and a spending cap and, you know, and, and, and. So he's the only one that's that seems to have embraced this. I'm surprised at the number of Republicans who pay minor lip service to the fiscal policy working group thing and then go off and do their own thing. Yeah, and they and, and Michael, the point is here, they, they put themselves in a corner when they do it. They put themselves in a corner. Cologne isn't saying don't spend. Cologne is 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 right in there saying, yes, we need additional spending for uh, for schools. Like like Republicans generally across the state are saying, they're saying, yes, we need additional spending. But because they're not talking about how they would raise the funds, they're a, they're leaving the implication that they're in favor of PFD cuts also, and B, they're putting themselves in a position where they can't call out their their opponents as hypocrites, and I I think that's a I think that's a a a, a mistake on the Republicans' parts. I mean the 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 Democrat Featherly in particular is just a sitting duck on this issue. You know you got Carol Como says says he's a fighter for kids. Well he's not. He's a fighter against kids. He's a fighter to take money out of kids' pockets. He's right. a fighter to take money out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families, which which he claims, you know, uh, uh, need the additional spending. Right. And 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 Cologne could call him out on that. The Republican Stanley Wright could call out Ted Ished, his opponent. Other Republicans could call out their opponents on that issue. They're just sitting ducks on that issue, but they can't because they haven't articulated. A, a funding plan, a funding approach, a, a fiscal approach like Ben has, that gives them the base to to be able to to be able to do that. And I think it's a mistake on the Republicans' part. Right now, some of this could be attributed to the fact that uh, Featherly and Colom are in like one of the most um, um, opulent districts in the state, one of the most uh, you know one of the most uh, wealthy districts, and so they just don't need the PFD. So he's just talking to his constituency, but she could still stick him on it if. She would find a plan that uh, and endorse the plan uh, that the fiscal policy working or some other thing that is equally uh, makes sense. But, you know, they're just talking to their constituency at this point. And those people are like, oh, we don't need no PFD over here. You know, you know, you know, the unique thing about Ben's plan is, as I as I complained in some in some previous in some previous programs, the, the unique thing about Ben's plan is it's also regressive. In the event, in the sense that it takes more from middle and lower income Alaska families than it do, does um, uh, upper income families, but it's so broad based. I wrote a column on this last week in the in the landmine. It's so broad based that even even at the tax levels, the the minimal tax levels that he's talking about, it takes less from middle and lower income Alaska families than a flat tax would. 
than 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 a tax based on based on income would. So it's a it's a it's a great plan in the sense that it's it it it, it expands the base so much that it takes just a little bit from from everybody. In Cologne, could could go in and say, look, yes, we need we need additional spending. We all need to contribute to it a little bit. Sales tax, Ben Carpenter sales tax is the right way to do it. Doesn't take much from my constituents. And it treats kids favorably because it reduces the burden, hugely reduces the burden from where we are now with PFD cuts uh, on middle and lower income Alaska families. It keeps money in kids' pockets as opposed to taking money out of their, out of their pockets. So Ben's got a plan, the, 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 the sales tax approach that Ben has, the broad-based sales tax that approach that Ben has really is a plan that Republicans, even in the wealthy districts, could talk about and talk about favorably with uh, with their constituents and at the same time point out the hypocrisy of the, the, the independents and the Democrats they're talking about when those guys talk about they're doing it for the kids. Right. Now you're talking about the I, the uh, Featherly Cologne race, but as you pointed out, it's Eyeshide versus right. There's there's other Republicans out there who are not endorsing any, any other kind of ideas who are, again, OK with the spending as long as it's one spends on their program and they don't have to say too loudly that it's coming from the PFD. Right. I mean, this is part of the problem with the Republicans that are out there right now. It's not just a Democratic problem. This is a Republican problem as well. It is. It is. And the Republicans, I mean, the Republicans are getting killed. on. I mean, they're getting killed on the K through 12 issue. And 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 what they're what they the reason they're getting killed is they're leaving themselves in a position where they're essentially saying, yeah, I sort of support K through twelve, but not as much as my opponent does. Um, and 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 because they're trying to say that they're conservative, they're gonna they're gonna keep part of the PFD. And I don't think it's coming off well. I think if the Republicans would say, yep, I'm K I I support K through twelve, I I support K through twelve with with parameters or with with uh, 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 testing or or whatever they want to put around it, that I support K through 12. But let me tell you, I support it in a way that my opponent doesn't. I support it in a way that doesn't take money out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families, doesn't take money out of, out of the pockets of kids. I truly support kids as opposed to my opponent who's wanting to take money away from kids. And I, th- and I think, I think that would be a, uh, I think that would be a good sell on the part of part of Republicans right now. They're playing, Sort of this wish, wishy washy defense of, of, yeah, I want to do it, but I don't really want to do it the same way he's doing it. And instead of being able to call out the other guy for saying, and he's trying to take money out of kids, out of the pockets of kids to do it, I've got a plan that wouldn't, I've got a plan that wouldn't do that. And I, and I think that wishy washiness is, is working against, uh, against Republicans in those races. Jeannie says, this is more than a mistake, Brad. It's party suicide. I mean, this has, again, been part of my my consternation with the Republican Party is that this really has stopped being a Democratic and Republican issue. This is a bigger state government versus smaller, you know, sp- bigger spend versus smaller spend problem, Brad, right? I mean, this is the label. You know, we should throw out the party labels and be looking at who favors just more state spending versus who favors a smaller state spend in the long run. Yeah, I, I I agree with that, Michael. And and it is a mistake. I mean, it, it is a mistake on the part of Republicans. I mean, they could talk about Ben's proposal. I, you know, as I look back on it, I think I think one of the big failures of the legislature last session was it was when Republicans voted down Ben's proposal in ways and means. Ben's voted down Ben's package essentially, but voted down the sales tax. Um, in ways and means. I'm not sure they fully understood it. Frankly, I'm not sure I fully understood it at the time. I haven't dug into it deeply until uh, until recently. But I think I think that was a big failure because it didn't give the Republicans something positive. It failed to get it. It, it prevented Republicans from having something positive to run on. I think Republicans could have said, "Look, yes, we need a little bit more K through 12." But we need to fund it fairly, and we need to fund it within constraints, and we need to fund it with a spending cap, and we need to fund it with a full fiscal plan. This 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 role that, this road that we're going down of using PFD cuts and taking it just out of kids' pockets and taking it out of the pockets 
of middle and lower income Alaska families isn't working and isn't right. We need a different plan. We need a different fiscal plan. We need a positive fiscal plan. And yes, I support K through 12 funding in the same way that, that Walter Featherly does, but I've got a plan to pay for it that doesn't take money out of kids' pockets, isn't hypocritical. And I think, I think the failure of the Republicans to pass that, the failure of the Republicans on ways and means to pass that took away from them a positive message that they could have had uh, coming into this campaign. Yes, I favor these things, but I favor it within constraints. And here's my fiscal plan that creates those constraints, as opposed to taking it out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. Ben's really the only one who's running on that. But I and and I think and I think successfully so. I think he's able to call out Bjorkman as being hypocritical because of that. I think the rest of the Republicans could have done that as well. And and it's a failing on their part not to have that sort of comprehensive plan that they're able to run on. Well, and to have all the other discussions surrounding the fiscal policy working group. I mean, even if you don't pass them all, at least to have the discussion. Uh, Kyle, who's coming in to stir the pot, says, Brad, do you support any of the other revenue measures outlined in the fiscal policy group, the double, the gas cap, legalized gambling, et cetera? I mean, I personally, I think all of these things should be at least up for discussion. I mean, if we're looking to try and reduce the size and scope of government, we're going to put a spending cap on that. we got to figure out where all the revenues are going to come from and everybody gets skin in the game. What do you say? Yeah, exactly right. But all of those things. I mean, that list could go on and on and on and on. And Kyle may have may have listed at some point on and on and on and on. But all of those things don't raise much. I mean, we're talking about a billion plus dollar deficit in the in the in the state uh, in the in the state budget. And oil taxes have to play a role in that. But the, even oil taxes, even reforming oil taxes don't get all that billion dollar deficit closed. And, and nobody's talking about taking the deficit down to zero. Nobody's talking. None of the Republicans are talking about those sorts of spending caps. So, yes, we need all the revenue measures, but we need to be we need to be realistic about how much they raise. And we need we need additional revenue measures on top of that that raise real money. Brad Keithley is our guest. The weekly top three continues. We're jumping into it now on number two, where we're going to talk about the Cook Inlet gas issue, which is it's kind of weird, Brad. I mean, you're hearing all different kinds of things. And is it a crisis? Is it not a crisis? But who's using it as a campaign issue? That's the big question here in number two. And why? Well, it's not a crisis. We've talked about we've talked about that before. There's plenty of gas out there in the world if that's what we need. Uh, and uh, and we just need to, to pipe it into uh, the Alaska system uh, if that's if that's what we need. We, we've got one candidate out there. I'm picking on Featherly today, but he deserves to be picked on. He may be the single worst candidate uh, for the legislature that's uh, that's running this year. In a column in the ADN, uh, where they interviewed both Cologne and uh, and Featherly about their about various proposals, they interviewed Featherly on energy, and he said he wants to see the state provide royalty and tax relief to current oil and natural gas shareholders uh, in the Cook Inlet. Featherly also proposed that the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority should become directly involved in resource development in joint ventures with current shareholders. Right. In other words, we need to give the producers money by, by giving them royalty and tax relief. Then we need to give them more money <laughs> by having the state uh, 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 essentially finance uh, some, of their, uh, some of their operations out in the Cook Inlet. That's going backwards. The problem with the Cook Inlet is that it's not economic. Yes, there may be gas out there, but it's not economic to produce. Economic in the sense that it, it costs more than alternatives. We saw that last year in the utility study. We've talked about that a lot. No one, no one has come forward with a different study that's shown that Cook Inlet in fact would be cheaper than the alternatives if it, it if it had to compete on its own, all we've seen are proposals to subsidize Cook Inlet, give state money, give money out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families to the producers in the Cook Inlet, subsidize them so they look like they're cheaper than the alternatives, but they wouldn't be because they're just taking money out of our pockets in order to in order to subsidize the producers in order to, in order to enable them to keep the prices down. 
you take away those subsidies and they're more expensive than the alternatives. And what, and what Featherly and others who talk about this are really proposing is to drag us into a system, drag us backward into a system where all of a sudden the state has to subsidize energies, has to subsidize gas costs uh, into South Central. There are lower priced alternatives, lower pri that don't need subsidies, lower priced alternatives than what Cook Inlet would be on an unsub unsubsidized basis. And we need to get down the road of doing that. Roger Marks had a uh, had an op-ed in the ADN this week. Uh, it uh, the title of it is "Imported Natural Gas May Be Less Costly Than Many Expect," and it talks about the potential suppliers of natural gas to the Cook Inlet, and it talks about potential pricing of natural gas to the Cook Inlet. Each Monday, we do a chart. Uh, it's called our Monday chart. We do a chart comparing the NSTAR gas cost adjustment against current global LNG futures. And when you look at, at current global LNG futures, the J Japan futures, LNG in Japan, LNG uh, to Europe, um, yes, cook it, uh, the, the current futures prices for LNG in the next couple of years are higher than the NSTAR price. But as the NSTAR price keeps going up, those LNG prices are coming down. As more and more LNG prices come on the market, those LNG prices are coming down. And by 2027, if you look at our chart, 2027, 2028, uh, those prices, the international prices, the, the, the Japanese prices, futures prices, are, are beginning to trend below the Cook Inlet prices. What we're seeing is the beginning of an LNG industry out there that's growing by leaps and bounds, growing in terms of, of volumes out there. We see additional projects being announced almost weekly. And, and there is the, the, the growing expectation that we're heading toward a glut of LNG. And so when you talk about pricing, I mean, go back to the utility, the utility study of a year ago. They found that even imported LNG, even LNG coming in on barges, was cheaper than the long-term Cook Inlet price uh, because of how costly uh, Cook Inlet was. We're also seeing the, the beginning of a number of proposals out there to develop renewable options. The, in, the increased uh, deliveries from Bradley Lake, from the hydropower down at Bradley Lake. We've seen in, in this week's uh, ADN, uh, there was a, a, an article entitled, Veterans of Alaska's Oil Industry Look to Blaze a Renewable Energy Pathway in the State, talking about a couple of guys who used to work for BP, who have set up a company and who are who are looking at developing uh, renewable power, uh, wind power to feed into the grid. We have solar power that's being talked about on the Kenai. There are a number of options. As the market's realizing the increased price of Cook Inlet production, there's a number of options developing out there that are lower priced, that are more economic for South Central. What Featherly and others who say, oh, we're going to defend the Cook Inlet no matter what, what they're, what they're suggesting is to plow more state money into these projects, plow more state money into the Cook Inlet through subsidies, tax subsidies, and through direct investment by ADA that are just going to keep sinking us deeper and deeper and deeper into the muck of an uneconomic, of an uneconomic gas supply. We ought to be looking forward. Candidates who are looking forward to saying, yep, Cook Inlet, if it can compete, that would be great. But, but all the projections are that it can't compete. We need to be looking at economic alternatives. We need to be looking at what LNG can do. We need to be looking at what renewables can do. We need to be looking at more economic alternatives as opposed to subsidizing the past, trying to, trying to keep the past alive by throwing more state money at it, increasing budget deficits, taking more money out of middle and lower income Alaska families. We ought to be looking forward and candidates Candidates like Featherly who want to sink us in the past, A, don't understand economics, energy economics, and B, they're, they're candidates who, th who say the state is a solution to everything. We don't need candidates like that. We, that's how we've gotten into this budget deficit. We need candidates looking forward who look to the market, who look to market economics, who understand energy economics, and who, who are looking for economic alternatives to meet Cook Inlet's needs.
you know, I uh, it, what really always strikes me is how people get so emotionally tied to this with Alaskan gas that somehow um, we're doing ourselves a disservice if we don't use our own resources, even when they're not economically viable. But it's OK to have the state pour all the money into it as long as we're using Alaska gas. No, no, really, no matter what the long term costs are. And that's what we seem to be hitting here. And then, of course, we had the same answer that several of the more conservative candidates have even said on the program. Well, if we if we import gas, we're at their mercy where they they can cut us off at any time. The they, the them, the there. And I'm just like, but who's they? I mean, we if, if that's the case, we could run out of toilet paper next week if they decided to cut us off uh, or food or whatever else we ship up here. Um, I mean, it, it, it seems like there's a lot of, uh, of fear mongering on that when you have to look at it kind of coldly in an economic light to realize in the long term, the state can't afford to be offsetting a lot of these costs in the in the long term because it's a sinkhole. I mean, how much money do you pour into it? And if the oil companies are benefiting in that way, will they just not encourage that kind of spend? Because, hey, we're doing OK, we're making money and we're doing this and we can do things that we can't do anywhere else because nobody else will pay to pay us for it. I mean, it, it just seems like it's a it's a never ending cycle. This is this is this generation's equivalent of of Hammond's Barley Project, right? This is this is where you know, for those who who don't recall it, Hammond had this his had this great conception that we're going to grow barley out in uh, out in the bush or out in out in interior Alaska, and we're going to become a big barley supplier. And 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 that was you know we pumped a bunch of state money into. Uh, in into uh, into that project. Well, it didn't work out. Economics didn't support it, and and we and we we couldn't we couldn't give it enough money to make it to make it economic, and so it finally died away. And and we look back on it, and we say, oh boy, that was a boondoggle. Why why the heck did we do that? Marketless let the market economics rule. It's the same thing going on here. If we pour a bunch of money into this. We're going to look back on it and say, why the heck did we do that? Because even Featherly is only talking about a couple of fields. He's talking about subsidizing John Hendricks's uh, uh, kitchen lights field. And he's talking about subsidizing Bluecrest's cosmopolitan field. And those get us only a little of the way toward what, toward what we need. What happens after that? Do we, do we now have to subsidize exploration? Do we now have to go out and spend even more money, turn ADA into an oil and gas company to be, you know, plunging holes around in the Cook Inlet. This is, it's a never, it's a never ending cycle. Once you get into this sort of state subsidized project, it's going to be a never, never ending cycle. You know, well, we decided we didn't want, we didn't want LNG. So we're going to have to keep exploring for Cook Inlet gas. Let's let market economics rule. As Roger Marks pointed out, there may be the, the LNG may be what people are saying about LNG may be Maybe LNG cost may be overblown. Certainly, the futures market is saying that that what people are projecting for LNG costs are overblown. The utility study last year said LNG of the of the alternatives out there right now, LNG is more economic. You know, the last thing we need, and some people are saying this, the last thing we need is this is this big line down from the from the North Slope that we'd have to pay off over forty years. We'd be locked into it. We wouldn't be able to pursue more economic alternatives because we'd be paying that sucker off for 40 years. We don't need to lock into long-term supplies. We need to we need to let the market evolve and develop the alternatives that are less less costly to us than uh, than what uh, than what the Cook Inlet would be if we had to subsidize it. I'm a pretty simple man, and uh, you know when it, when I look at this, I look at known supplies and unknown supplies is how i look at this like known supplies of of imported lng we know what it's going to be we know that it's stable we know it's going to be there would i love to have alaskan gas absolutely but where is it how do we find it is it really there and it's all this if come versus the actual you know the 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 potential it might be there but let the market decide don't don't try and subsidize all these things to the point of because we know what happens with subsidies they grow and grow and grow and grow and then they realize oh it was a boondoggle we forgot we forgot to check our math at the end you know we already know that it will be cheaper to bring it in and again i'm not happy having i would not be happy having to import alaska gas but if it makes sense economically in the long run, 
um, you know, when the extraction technology gets better or when the, 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 uh, discovery technology gets better, the exploration technology gets better, we might find more gas in these areas. And hey, look, we've got a, we've got a landfill or we've got a, 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 a you know, a, a, a big surprise here. That's great. I just, I find it hard to think that people want to bet on the if come rather than the sure thing at this point. Well, we got, we got people who are doing that though. I mean, we got Featherly and, 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 and what they're doing, what they're just going to stall progress. They're going to stall the development of more economic alternatives. They're going to stall the market and as, as part of this nostalgia play of, of we need cook inlet gas. We, we're always going to need cook. We just have to have cook inlet gas. You know, it's like it's it's got some, you know, magical qualities to it. We have to have cook inlet gas. And we need it so much, we're just going to pour a bunch of state money in there. We're just going to pour a bunch of middle and lower PFD cuts for middle and lower income Alaska families. Because federally, he's already told us he doesn't he doesn't believe in the PFD. So we're just going to pour more and more and more money from Alaska families uh, in, in into this effort in a nostalgia play to keep looking backwards, to keep looking at, you know, we've always been supplied by the Cook, Cook Inlet. We always need to be supplied by the Cook Inlet. Those candidates that are doing that aren't candidates we want to elect. They're going to take the oxygen. They're going to suck the oxygen out of the room when we talk about true alternatives developing a state economy that's based on true economics as opposed to false economics of, of state of state subsidies. They're just yeah. gonna, they're going to drag us into the past. We need candidates who are forward looking, who rely on the market, who want to find market alternatives, who want to create a level playing field for market alternatives and let Alaska develop develop economically as opposed to in a state subsidized fashion. Brian says it right here. It distorts the market and leads to more malinvestment. That's what happens when you get all that government money in there. It distorts the market because it's you're not allowing the free market to make the choices, the true economic choices, because you're propping everything up. Frank says in regards to uh, that that question about, oh, they may just cut us off. He goes, don't we ship all our other fuel in? Not all of it, but a big chunk of it. We do ship in a big chunk, especially gasoline. Um, the heating oil, a lot, a lot of the heating oil is made here, but everything, you know, a lot of everything else is, is shipped in. So yeah, what's to cut us off from that? What's to cut us off again from toilet paper or food or whatever? We have to ship a lot of that stuff in. I mean, why? Because of the economics. I mean, we used to be the, you know, the Matsu used to be the breadbasket of Alaska until it became economically unfeasible to continue because it was cheaper to ship stuff in. That doesn't necessarily make us stable and secure if something were to ever happen. But at the same time, that's the economics of it. People couldn't afford to live here uh, uh, otherwise. I mean, that's that's kind of the bottom line, Brad. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. And there, those people, I mean, like Featherly and others who say, oh, no, 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 we've got to, we've got to keep this, we, who have a nostalgia play, we've got to keep the cook in and alive. Those people are raising the costs to live in Alaska. They may say, oh, no, if we subsidize it enough, it'll look cheaper, but we've subsidized it. We've taken money out of somebody's pocket. We've taken money out of, out of Alaskans' pocket in order to subsidize it and make it look cheaper. It's more expensive. After you strip the subsidies off, it's more expensive. That's what the utility study from last year told us. That, in fact, is what the futures market, the LNG futures market, is telling us. That it's more expensive to, to to use Cook Inlet gas, and so if we just try to hang on to that in a nostalgia play, we're just making that Alaska more expensive. Alaska already has a higher cost of living than the rest of the lower forty-eight. We're already bleeding people out in substantial part because of our higher cost of living, and 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 the people who are saying the want to make the nostalgia play of keeping the Cook Inlet alive by pouring state money into it are just going to make it even more expensive. Right. Well, and driving the point home, it's not just state money. As Jeannie says, drive the point home, say the, re say it's the residents money, not the state's money. It's not just state money. It's money that's coming out of your pocket because where's the money coming from the PFD. I mean, all of those, you know, credits and revenues and everything else that will all have to come from somewhere and they're already spending to the max. Well, then, Where's it coming from? The PFD. That's the biggest pot of money until that's gone. And then there will be taxes. That's that's the that's the thing. There'll be other taxes. There'll be additional taxes. PFD cuts are already taxes. 
but but it's but but that's I mean that's exactly right. It's not free. Cook inlet gas is not a free good. If you start subsidizing it to produce it, it's not a free good. It's not a less expensive good. It's a more expensive good that's just subsidized. Right. I mean, right. We could we could have we could have made barley less less expensive if we just would have kept right. pouring state money in. Well, and and Kyle makes a great point. He says the long, slow, expensive death of the Matanuska made dairy is exactly what's happening at Cook Inlet Gas. They tried to prop that up and keep that open in the Matsu for years with more and more state money. And eventually they're like, this is not economically viable. We can't do this. And they figured it out. I mean, it's the same kind of thing. And I mean, how long would it take us to figure it out? How how long would it take us to figure it out in the Cook Inlet when everybody's dependent on it? Uh, would it be 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, and we realize we poured millions and millions and millions of, of residents' dollars, citizens' dollars into this to make it, quote, unquote, cheaper? Because you're never seeing the true cost because you're paying for it out of your PFD cuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, uh, it, as I say, we look back on barley and we say, why the hell do we do that? We look back on, and Kyle's got a good point, we look back on, on uh, on Matt Niska made and we and we say why the hell did we ever do that why did we pour that money in there and it's going to be exactly the same with the Cook Inlet except now we have the opportunity to prevent that going in or prevent it going further going in we have the opportunity to say look we're going to let economics rule if the Cook Inlet can find production that's that's lower cost great buy all you can get it into the system if they can't do that then we need to find more economic alternatives. Right. And, and we're seeing the unleashing of economic alternatives as people talk right. about various renewable projects. Sure. Well, I'll go a step further. I'd, I'd say I'd even be willing to pay a little more for gas, even if it was slightly more than LNG, because if the long-term benefits are we have it here, then even a slight increase is better. But if it's substantially different, which is what the report is showing, then it doesn't make any sense. Why do Why do we continue in that? But Michael, why would you even pay a little bit more? I mean, you're subsidizing that. You're 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 increasing the cost of living in Alaska for 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 that benefit. Look, the world runs on trade. Sure. As 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 Frank pointed out, we get a bunch of our fuel already from from elsewhere in the world. The world runs on trade. We Alaska is part of that. Alaska benefits from that. We get cheaper cost goods from outside. We Let's, ought to, we we ought not to stop that now. Brad Keithley is our guest. Alaskans for sustainable budgets. We're on to number three of the weekly top three. Some moves up on the North Slope, uh, Brad. What's uh, what's going on? Uh, what's going on up there? So there have been a couple of headlines about the recent um, uh, sale by Chevron of its assets on the North Slope, and some concern I've seen. And I've heard some people express about, well, we're just having another major uh, leave the state, um, and that's a and that's a problem. It's really not. So let's talk just a second for why Chevron's doing this, and then let's talk about what's coming in its place. Chevron's doing this because Chevron just made a huge, major acquisition of Amarada Hess, just approved by the Federal Trade Commission, just approved by the by the federal government. Uh, they're on the, the on track to close it if they haven't already closed it. Big deal for Chevron. Significant change to to its uh, its corporate reserve uh, basis. And Chevron's realized, like all majors do, when they do a bit major deal, you can't own everything. So if I can, if I'm going to buy this this toy, if I'm going to buy Emirata Hess and get the benefits out of the Emirata Hess transaction, and they're substantial. Amarada Hess owns a substantial position off of Guyana, one of the new major oil plays out there. Amarada Hess has a position in the Permian Basin and has a position elsewhere uh, in the world that's a good add, a good match for uh, for Chevron's production base. But if you're going to buy this new toy, you have to, you know, sort of like sort of like our mothers told us at some point, if you're going to get a new toy, you have to give an old one up because you can't you can't just hoard toys to to the to the nth degree. So Chevron's Chevron's repositioning itself by getting rid of some assets that are that don't fit its base as well anymore. It announced the sale of its Alaska assets yesterday. It announced the sale of its Canadian tar sands or tar uh, uh, oil tar oil sands. There we go. I'm not supposed to use the word tar oil sands um, uh, assets uh, and and some other Canadian assets. So 
Chevron's just repositioning its base. That's why Chevron's selling. It's not that it's nothing against Alaska. Chevron held a non-operating interest, a very small non-operating interest, uh, took some of its uh, attention and some of its time to pay attention to it. Um, and, and so repositioning that, getting some money out of that to re help reposition, help pay for Emirata Hess is a, is a good thing for that. That's why Chevron's doing it. It's not because they suddenly got upset with Alaska. It's, it's, right, they're right. doing it because they're repositioning their base. What's the good news out of that is that, is that there were offers for the Chevron assets from sort of these private investment funds that, that are cropping up in the oil industry. Funded by private money, uh, form an oil company, usually a non-operating oil company, non-operated oil company to come in and make investments and in, in sort of ride the, uh, the the wave of revenues from oil uh, in that fashion. It's an oil play by by some of these uh, some of these private funds, and there were there were offers made for the Chevron assets uh, by some of these by some of these private companies, and that would have. If they had, if Chevron had accepted those, if that would have been where we went, that would have been sent a message that that maybe things aren't perfect, that we're now getting sort of some more hill corps, if you will, that are coming in and and taking uh, taking parts of the of the state's oil base. But that's not what happened. What happened was Conoco, which is a which is a a, a, a joint interest owner, a joint owner with Chevron in these various assets, exercised its right of first refusal. That you have under the operating agreement, uh, exercised its right of first refusal to to buy these assets from Chevron instead. Under operating agreements, the joint owners all have a right of first refusal. If if someone wants to sell, they have a right of first refusal uh, to take those assets uh, at the at whatever the market price is, whatever the, the the going rate is for those assets. And Conoco exercised its right uh, to to do that uh, with with respect to the production assets. And that's a good sign, actually, because it means Conoco is stepping up and saying, look, we like Alaska. We like the revenue. We like the resource base we've got in Alaska. We like the position we've got in Alaska. And we're willing to pay a little bit more uh, to, uh, to expand that resource base a little bit more. If they would have, if they would have said, nah, we don't want those assets. Let the, let the private equity people have it. That would have been a sign that maybe Conoco didn't believe as strongly in its Alaska base, sign that maybe there's a little bit of a question mark there. But the fact that Conoco is stepping up and exercised its right of first refusal, I think, is a is a is a positive sign uh, for Alaska and a positive sign about about their their beliefs in our resource base. They did uh, apparently they did let Chevron sell some of its pipeline interests to these private equity owners. And and part of the equity position in the Kaparik line was sold to Doyon uh, as as well. Um, but pipelines are a little bit different. Pipelines are just sort of money makers, um, as long as you got oil behind it. Pipelines are um, they sort of uh, just you know, I mean they charge a tariff, they charge a rent for the use of the system, um, and 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 you have to invest every once in a while, but you get sort of a steady steady stream of money out. Uh, uh, sort of a utility type uh, right. return on those assets. And so um, they did let the private equity owners in on that, but that's not the same thing as letting the private equity owners in on the upstream on the oil and gas assets. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially the, that's the easy money is the, is the pipeline. You basically have to spend a little money to maintain, but other than that, you're just, you're just got a meter on it. Every gallon that goes by, you're making a little money on every, every gallon or every barrel that goes by. So it's a, it's easy money at that point. It is. And, and it's not really, I mean, pipelines are not as sensitive. The reason, the reason you, the reason you want to focus on, on maintaining your upstream positions, because you then, then you get the information about, about what the, what the new opportunities are. You make the decision about where you want to develop the new opportunities. You make the decision about the pace you want to develop the new opportunities. You make the decision about where you want to drill new wells. Pipelines really aren't that way. Pipelines, you're not getting a whole lot of information. You're not getting a whole lot of, 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 of opportunity, upside opportunity out of pipelines. So it's more of an investment play than it is a, uh, than it is than than the upstream is, and Conoco still has held on to 
the majority position, even in the Kaparic pipeline, and is held on to the role of operator, which really makes the decisions about where you go. It, to the extent there is a decision about where you go and at what pace on a pipeline, it's really the operator and the majority owner that makes that decision. And Conoco is held on to that. So I can understand letting the letting the financial players in on in on a pipeline, the sort of the the, the people who just are looking for returns in on a pipeline. Conoco's really held on to the decision making process and and made the decision to invest more money to keep their position in the upstream. And as I said, I think that's a good thing for Alaska, a good signal for Alaska. So again, showing Alaska is still a viable player in the oil and gas market. All right, Brad, last two minutes, uh, some eight. Everything we've uh, put together here, especially in light of the fact that we're, what, three weeks away, three and a half weeks away here from the elections, and we look at all this stuff. Give us a give us a summation here on the way out the door. Well, I think the Republicans have missed an opportunity um, to go back to the first one and, and maybe the most important one in light of the election coming up. I think Republicans have really missed an opportunity to uh, uh, to to call uh, out Democrats and independents for the hypocrisy that they're that they're engaged in, saying they want to spend, but they want to they want to shield the top twenty percent non residents and oil companies from paying for that spending. They just want to spend on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. I think Republicans have really missed an opportunity. Republicans just sort of look like a lot of Republicans just sort of look like Democrat light. Yeah, I want to spend, but I'm not sure how I want to spend. I mean, I'm not sure I've we got a plan on how to spend other than just you know take less maybe from middle and lower income Alaska families. I think they missed an opportunity to have a big a big push on a responsible fiscal plan that put Democrats on the defensive. And on the on the second thing in terms of the election, the second issue, we need candidates who are forward looking about Cook Inlet and who are looking at letting the market develop the best, most economic response to Cook Inlet, as opposed to looking backward uh, nostalgic and trying to keep the trying to keep Cook Inlet gas alive. I plugged it by throwing more and more and more state money at it. We need we need candidates who are who have the understanding, the knowledge and the feel for where the energy industry is going, where the Alaska energy, the the the, the electricity and the and the gas industry are going right. forward. We need candidates who understand that as opposed to candidates who are looking backward. Well and again not get stuck in what you're calling the nostalgia loop. Uh, which I think is, I mean, again, it's a, it's another way of saying this emotional tie to it must be Alaska gas no matter what, um, even if it doesn't make economic sense, which uh, ought to make everybody scratch their head and go, wait a second, this should always make economic sense. Uh, otherwise, again, it'll be another barley project. It'll be another bat made. It'll be something. I asked Kyle what he thought, uh, what, you know, what, what he would, you know, if he, if he doesn't like the fiscal policy working group plan, what was his plan? And he said, I support the statewide flat income tax with zero exemptions. I support closing the S-Corp loophole. I support a higher o overall oil and gas tax regime. I support ending pr uh, production credits, not exploration credits. And I support auditing AD, uh, ADIA and AHFC and DOT capital spending uh, audits. Thanks for asking. I mean, I think those are all good things. I think each and every one of those is a viable step in the right direction. Um, but again, trying to make it all work. We, I mean, I don't see anybody proposing any of those things in the in the legislature. We gotta have, we gotta work with what we got in front of us, right, Brad? Well, yeah, but I but I think Kyle, I think actually, I think that's a good platform with one with one exception, and I'm 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 sort of moving away from where I've been on the flat tax, but the exception is is Ben's sales tax, and and the and the difference is Ben's broad base. I mean, the sales taxes we've had people talk about in the past, the sales tax that was proposed during the Walker administration, the sales tax that, that the Dunley administration, in fact, talked about in 2020 and 2021, or was it yeah, 2020 and 2021, the, the sales taxes they talked about were narrow base sales taxes. And with a narrow base, what you're doing is you're pushing the, the, the burden on middle and lower income Alaska families above a flat tax. And so a flat tax seemed more appropriate uh, more fair, more equitable than a sales tax when you're talking about a narrow base sales tax. What Ben's proposal is, and 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 again, go read my column from in last Friday's uh, landmine because that really I try to lay it out. What Ben's proposal is a, is a very, 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 very broad base sales tax, almost to the to the ends of of GDP, 
all of the revenue for all of the businesses, revenue produ producing businesses in the state. And, and at that broad scale, you're pushing a lot of the burden that otherwise is falling on, on middle and lower income Alaska families, certainly falling on them from PFD cuts, but to a degree would also fall on them from a flat tax. You're pushing that burden off on, you're pushing that burden broadly instead on tourists, non-residents, uh, products that are being sold into the lower 48 products that are being sold internationally. You're pushing a lot of burden away from Alaska families onto, onto other things. And that burden on those other things is not very big because you're spreading it so broad. The divisor is so big. The divisor into the revenue you're trying to raise is so big that the burden is, is a very thin stretch on, on everybody. So Kyle, back to your thing. I think that's, I think that's, I think that's a good, good outline, but I would urge you and others to consider Ben sales tax as an alternative to the flat tax. Yes, it's still regressive, but it's, but it takes less from middle and lower income Alaska families than even a flat tax would not only less than the PFD cut would does, but less than a flat tax would. And I think, I think that's a positive development. So that's, that's the one amendment I would make to my past positions. And it's an amendment I would make to, uh, to Kyle's proposal. Several people, including Franks and Greg, have pointed out the problem with the sales tax is that we, the business owners, become the collectors. And Frank says, uh, you know, who has to collect the tax, keep track of it, return to the state, maintain the records for X number of years. There is a cost to businesses to try and collect this, which has not, you know, really been discussed in any of this. And I know that that is one of the downsides to a sales tax is that you're essentially making every business owner a tax collector under penalty of law. If they do something wrong or they mess up or anything else, it can be a problem in that regard. Yep, it, 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 it is. But but we've got, I mean, come on, guys, we got to raise revenue somehow, right? And the question really needs to be, what's the best for the overall Alaska economy? And what's best for the overall Alaska economy is to make it as broad as possible and as thin as possible for for all of the all of the various pieces of the of the Alaska economy. It would be great if we didn't need to raise additional revenue, but that's not the world we live in. And so the analysis needs to be what's best for the overall Alaska economy. What hits the overall economy the least hard? And and a broad-based sales tax, particularly the ultra-broad tax that uh, that Ben's talking about, uh, has has the advantage of doing that, taking the least from everybody, as opposed to piling it on, right. piling it on somebody. Right. Well, and again, Jeannie says broad-based taxes are still coming out of we the people's pockets. But I think your point is this is the least impactful or the least that, you know, it leaves us with the most money in our pocket in the long run. Is that right? Yep. I mean, so Ben's proposal is 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 about 60 percent comes out of the pockets of Alaska families, make, maybe maybe a little bit less. Um, even the even the even the top 20 percent pay some. But but a little bit less. The rest of it's coming from tourists, non-residents, businesses doing international and and exporting to lower 48 and, and other business transactions. Um, and so yes, it's coming out of the people's pockets to a point, uh, but it's not coming out nearly as much, not nearly as much as coming out of people's pockets as with PFD, which is entirely focused on Alaska families, has no broad base at all, right? And less less even than a flat tax. Uh, final thoughts, Brad. Uh, Sixty seconds here. Well, we've got we've got a short time to go in the election, and I think I think what we what in the campaigns, what we ought to be doing is looking for people who we don't want. <laughs> Walter Featherly leads the charge on that because not only is he trying to tax middle or family tax kids, but he's also looking backwards on on energy policy. We need to look people who are looking forward and who are least open to the idea of finding revenue options that do not burden any one segment of the Alaska economy, but spread it across the, the broadest possible uh, base. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friends. I appreciate you uh, coming on board. We'll talk to you next week, okay? Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. 
This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.